Sander, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, are going to talk about IPC. So, um, a round of applause for IPC in one, two, three. So uh, thank you for the introduction. So sorry for the, uh, the short delay. Um, there was some problem with the connection. Uh, so uh, welcome to our talk, uh, IPC in one, two, three. I'm Dimitri. Uh, this is Sander. And uh, so we are students, uh, researchers from Ghent University in Belgium. Um, it's not very far from here, from Brussels. And we work on a uh, topic. Our topic is next generation internet. And uh, if you saw the, the presentation this morning, uh, we work on European projects, European funded projects like Irati, Pristine, Arcfire. They, they are uh, projects in the topic of future internet. And we do research on uh, test beds which are funded by the European Commission and by the US. Uh, FIRE, actually the, the, the person that gave the presentation this morning is very involved in this FIRE project and the NGI is the successor of FIRE. And we also use Genie, which is the global environment for network innovation in the US. And they are very large test beds that provide us with a lot of servers and interconnections so we can do uh, large-scale experimentation. Um, so why do we need the next generation internet? Well, if you have been following the news, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, there's attacks on the infrastructure, like on servers, where you do uh, DDoS attacks. Um, scalability problems, where your BGP routers are overflowing with uh, entries. And there's also attacks on the physical infrastructure from uh, sharks, apparently. They are attracted to undersea cables by the magnetic fields and they disrupt uh, the connections. And also, uh, the Russians are um, developing ships that could, in theory, uh, break undersea cables. So there's disruptions of the infrastructure. Uh, also, internet security, there's a lot of hacks going on. Um, bugs in Heartbleed, very important. And also, there are problems with security. We all know the Snowden leaks. And um, your data is actually worth a lot to a lot of companies, and it's not only the government that's after your data, but also a lot of private companies, they data mine everything. So uh, our methodology is that we basically, well, we do experimental research, and it's quite hard to do experimental research on the internet of the future because it's not here yet. So we de develop it ourselves, so we develop a lot of tools and software, and we then uh, deploy it on our test beds, um, and then we write research papers about them. So what we're going to talk about today is about uh, the stuff, the prototypes that we have been developing, and we are looking at uh, the problems like reliability and uh, privacy on the internet from an architectural perspective. So what you've all been taught in school is like the seven layer OSI model. And uh, they try to, to build networks from the perspective that every layer has a, has a different function. They try to split layers by function. But when you look at how it's implemented, that's not always the case. So encryption is in the presentation layer by OSI, but it's implemented in the transport layer with TLS. It's usually also in your application. And there's a lot of technology cro crossover even in the lower layers. So recent developments for Ethernet, they are actually implementing routing, which is typically layer three into layer two networks. So there are also technologies like MPLS at layer two and a half, VPNs, which don't really fit the model, tunnel IP tunnels don't really fit the model. So um, a couple of years ago, there's a guy that wrote a book, John Day, and he proposed an alternative architecture for large scale networks, and it's recursive. So every layer is exactly the same. So we don't say every function is in a different layer, but all layers have all the functions. Possibly, you don't have to implement them if you don't need them. And the, the only way that, that the layers are different is by scope. So you have a big network over a small network, and if you need a VPN, you just run it on top. Um, for that to work, you need an identical API between the layers, or you cannot stack them. And currently, that's not the case. So you have the sockets API. You can access every network layer like you want. So if you want to uh, run TCP transport, you would run uh, an internet uh, address family and say, I want a streaming socket, or if you want UDP, you would use a datagram socket. But the, the API is a little bit different for every layer that you want to use. Um, so what we have been developing is a prototype called Ouroboros. And it's, what is Ouroboros? It's a decentralized packet switch network that is based on IPC. So, so the, the API is based on IPC. 
It's redesigned from the ground up. It follows this recursive model. Uh, it blurs the difference between IPC, between local networks, between world area networks. To the application developer, it all looks the same. It looks like IPC. Um, it gives you, uh, we hope, a better service uh, than you are used to from TCP and UDQP because we have different ways of, of implementing this functionality. It's increased privacy, security, anonymity, and it's a very simple API. It's a simply the simplest API that I don't know, and that's where we're going to start. So we're going to look at the Ouroboros API. So you have your computer, you have two processes sitting there, and what happens, your kernel is giving it two process IDs. So we have this layer. We will gradually tell what's in there. So the, these, um, the layering, I think, which one is mine? This so, excuse me. So the recursive model always works over a layer, and we'll, now it's a very abstract thing, but we'll get to what a layer actually does and what it consists of. So you have a client and a server in your local PC, so it's just one machine, and it gets a PID from the kernel, and you, um, we allocate something that's called a flow, and it's an abstract construct, it's a pipe, it's a bidirectional pipe, where you write packets on one end, and you have a reasonable probability that you can read them from the other, other end. So that's a flow of abstract construct. And the function of the layer is to provide you with a flow. So uh, the first call is flow accept. You, you have a server application. It will accept flows. It returns you something that we call a flow descriptor. And any resemblance with a file descriptor is purely coincidental. Um, so on the client side, you have the call flow allocate, which will start a flow towards the server. You could do that based on the PID, but that's a little bit difficult. I mean, that would be every time you start a server, it gets a new PID. So we have uh, a second uh, function that we implement, and it's called binding. So we just assign a certain name in whatever namespace to that, uh, to that process. You register it in the layer. It's a function that, which we will come back later. And you can allocate to the name. That's roughly the full API. After you allocate it, so it's IPC in one, two, three, these are the three functions. Binding names, registering the name in the layer, and allocating a flow. After that, you can read and write from the buffer. The signature of those calls is exactly the same as read and write from your uh, favorite system calls. And when you're done with, with uh, communication, you deallocate the flow. So, your kernel currently doesn't know these calls, so we had to implement them in our, uh, for the system, and we chose to do it in user space. So we have a user space system. We implemented this in C89 just to make it as portable as we could and keep very low dependencies, and it's based on POSIX 2001-2008, uh, mostly uh, for the threading. We use a lot of P-threads and mutexes, robust mutexes if they're available in the system. Um, it runs on GNU Linux, on FreeBSD, on OS X Sierra, and if you have the, Lindo, uh, the Linux subsystem for Windows, it works perfectly fine there. There is some work to get it to run on the GNU Hurt and on Android. Android doesn't completely implement POSIX, so there's, there's more work, and we haven't done that yet, so, so the prototype doesn't work there. So the core part of the system is a daemon. We call it the IPC Resource Manager daemon. And the, so you can start this by just running the binary, or you can start it, uh, enable it using systemd so that it actually runs as a daemon in your system. Uh, this is a complete s uh, source code example. It's C, so if you know C, that helps. If you don't know C, uh, it's reasonably simple it's, and self-explanatory. So you have a, the full source code of a server and clients in C. So the API is extremely simple. You have the server which will accept the flow a client which allocates the flow to a certain name. We hard-coded that to be echo. Uh, the client sends one message to the server. The server sends it back, and they deallocate the flow. So this is the output if you run there. The echo app, it will start the server. To say, I get a new flow when the client allocates it. Client says hi, and that's it. So very simple API, and it's the same API always. So what are the functions of a layer? Because that layer has to provide all the functionality that you need to, for, two, uh, for two processes to communicate with each other. So first of all, the bind operation is not a part of the layer. The, the bind operation where you bind that process to your name is something that's local to your system 
because process IDs you don't need to send that anywhere over any network. So that's a local call in the system. So the only two things that the, that the, the layer has to produce or to perform is to register names and to perform the flow allocation. So these functions are keep track and figure out where there are endpoints of communication. So that's a directory service. It will map uh, locations on certain names in the network. It will figure out how to get packets from one point to another. So it has to implement routing functionality. It has to effectively forward those packets. So it implements forwarding functionality. And it has to allocate and release the resources. And that's our uh, flow allocation. So this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, so actually, there are functions in the layer like congestion control, but we're not going to uh, discuss that today. We don't have time. Um, so let's look at local IPC over uh, the Ouroboros subs uh, subsystem. So usually, if you have a TCP IP stack, local, local IPC, you use your loopback loop interface. It goes through the entire stack. So your, your application delivers it to TCP, to your Ethernet. Uh, usually virtualized, goes through the kernel, and gets back. So in our system, we can do that as well, but of course it's recursive. There is no really need for all these layers, so you can do it directly over a loopback layer. So we'll show you the actual commands to, uh, imp to perform this on, on your system. So you start the Ouroboros subsystem. Then you start the server, and the first thing that it will do is indicate to the subsystem that there is an Ouroboros-capable uh, server running. Uh, this happens all behind the, behind the scenes, so you don't have to implement. It's uh, implemented using um, yeah, using the linker, so it's implemented before you, you even call main. So it just says to that system, I, I am here, I'm a, a Neuroboros process. Um, the next thing that you do is, that we do is bind that name, that process 6417, to the name server. So the Ouroboros system knows that 6417 listens to the name server. Um, then we create the layer. Uh, it's one command. It's a bootstrap command for the layer itself, for all the functionality for moving packets between the client and the server. Then we register the server into that layer. We, we don't register the name server directly uh, for we just hash it, so, so the, you can choose a hash algorithm as you like. Um, we just um, hash it for, it's more secure in the implementation because people cannot start feeding very large strings. Um, and it's more secure as well because if you have to send this over the network, it's less legible and people aren't able to figure out what happens. And then the third step, you start the, the, the client. It's a ping client. It will send a number of messages to the server when you're done, you kill the client, flow gets deallocated, and we're done. So that's how uh, local IPC over the subsystem works. And it's always in three steps, binding, registering, and allocating. And that's all that's to it. So there is, there is very little configuration. You don't have to worry about ports or addresses. That's all completely hidden from you. So let's look at Ouroboros over layer X. So we're not on one system anymore. We're on two systems. So um, to run it over layer X, we have to wrap that layer X with our API. So the, uh, the first thing, we start your Borob subsystem, and we create, uh, in this case, a layer instantiation on that machine, which is uh, it's, um, attached to your Ethernet device. So the only configuration that we give to the system is I want thing, something that connects to Ethernet. I give the layer a name, Ethernet, and I say it's connected to my wireless interface. After we do that, I register a name in that layer. So from now, my Ethernet layer locally is something like ARP, but not, not completely. We implemented it ourselves. Um, but, so it registers that hash, and it says on this machine, if I get a request for a... Um, for communication with IOQ3, I'll explain that in short, uh, I will accept it. So um, instead of only having our own uh, applications, uh, IOQuake is actually a, an open source project. It's uh, developed from the Quake 3 Arena engine that was a GPL released years ago. 
and we um, wrote a patch for it so that you can run the game over our stack instead of over Ethernet or TCP IP. Um, and then I bind the program, which is, this is the, the binary for the, the dedicated server. And so the previous time we bound the process, but actually that's also, you have every time you have to look for the, P, the process ID. So we just say, whenever this, this kind of binary is started, just have it listen to IO crew three names. So we start the server and it's done. So that's the setup of the server side. There is absolutely no configuration involved instead of saying it has to be on that wireless interface. For the clients, we start the client. It's the Ouroboros subsystem. Then we say again to the client, we connect it to the wireless interface. And all that client does is start, it, uh, the, start actually the game client. And it says connect. So we, we modify the game client so that it takes uh, yeah, our command. So we say connect it over Ouroboros to the IOQ3 server, and it does it, and you are in the game. So again, it's only three commands that you have to give. You um, register the name, you bind the process to the name, and from the other side, you allocate the name. It's pretty simple. So for reliability, um, Ethernet is not very reliable. So you can have packet loss, you can have jitter, which is normally implemented by TCP IP. And TCP IP is usually in a different layer. In Ouroboros, this is not the case. So it's, it's in the library, and every, every program that links against our library performs its own uh, connection management. It performs its own encryption and its own checksumming. So when you have the, the process communicating with each other and something happens to one of these processes, um, you can recover from a lot of crashes. So only if your actual program crashes you, have, um, you lose your, your connection. Uh, it does fragmentation, encryption, and sex, checksumming. So uh, we talked about Ouroboros over layer X, so we implemented it over Ethernet. But we actually have a, a proof of concept that runs it directly over NetFPGA, so it's not over layer two, it's actually over Ethernet layer one, the physical. So we're not using MAC addresses or the, the MAC interface, it's a point-to-point -point connection over the NetFPGA uh, implementation. We have it over um, layer two, so that's the Ethernet that I talked about. And this works over, on OSX, it works over the Berkeley packet filter. Uh, on FreeBSD, it runs over the Berkeley packet filter or NetMap, if you have that installed. And on Linux, it uses raw sockets. So the only thing that really does is it takes your, um, takes your packets and flushes it out of the, of the, the network towards the correct destination. The actual configuration is happened at, already happened before. And for layer three, four, we implemented it directly over UDP. So for all the functions that the layer has to provide, uh, this flow allocation, routing, forwarding, and directory are implemented in different ways. So for the, the, the Raptor NetFPGA, it's all done by us because it's, it's over layer one. For the Ethernet LLC, it depends on how your Ethernet is configured, but uh, it uses Ethernet. For the directory, it uses Ouroboros. We have it implemented it ourselves, but we could use ARP because the ARP specification, it allows you to um, resolve any layer three address to a layer two address. But actually, if it's not IP, most switches will just drop it for security reasons. They will check somebody is doing something very, very weird on this network. We're not going to allow that. So that's why we're not using the ARP, because it was dropping our packets. And then for UDP, uh, the routing is done usually using OSPF or uh, ISIS, forwarding IP. And we, use, we have implemented a, a dynamic DNS, which is implementing our directory service. So now we have two systems, and Sandra is going to show you Ouroboros over Ouroboros. Yeah. You want this? better? A bit? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Ouroboros over Ouroboros, uh, because it's a recursive architecture. 
So it's our bars over our bars, over our bars, over our bars, over our bars. Um, so in the previous example that uh, Dimitri explained, we were communicating between two systems. So two applications that are communicating just over the Ethernet layer, so allocating a flow over this Ethernet layer. Um, of course, we don't want to stop there uh, because we want to extend the scope over which we can communicate. So uh, we wrote a special application uh, called a normal IPC process, which also just uses the same API as a regular application. Uh, and one of the main functions of this IPCP is to forward uh, packets that it receives so that we can extend the scope to an internet level in the end. Um, so together, these normal IPCPs, they work together uh, in a normal layer to provide IPC for applications. So you can see it's, uh, that it's basically the same uh, as the applications of just over the Ethernet layer, but now it's over the normal layer. So the applications, they don't care uh, what layer they are using. Um, and uh, I depicted the path here that if the left application would talk to the right application, this is the path to the network that it would follow. So it goes to the normal layer, which uses the services of the Ethernet layer to go to the next IPCP in the normal layer, uh, which then uses the services of the Ethernet layer uh, to reach the final IPCP there uh, until it arrives uh, at the application. Um, well, I've drawn in, uh, it, it like this, but it's important to realize that the normal layer is using also the mechanism of flows uh, in, the, in the Ethernet layer and that no kind of information is exchanged between the different layers. So let's try a bit more difficult of an example uh, so we can keep on adding layers to extend the scope. So in this example, we have three applications, uh, one on system one, one on system three, one on system four, uh, and I've added some layers and let's say the leftmost uh, application wants to talk to the rightmost application then the paths through the network would be the following. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the middle application uh, cannot talk to the left application. Uh, it would need another IPCP in the topmost normal layer uh, in order to be able to communicate. Uh, it would be able to communicate with the rightmost application by just using the service provided by the second uh, layer, so uh, the first normal layer in its system. So within each normal layer, we have a collection of IPCPs that co cooperate with each other uh, to form the layer. Uh, and they are all equal. It's completely decentralized, the architecture. So there's no central component, um, which also makes it more secure uh, and scalable. Um, so the main objective of such a normal layer, I uh, already explained, but this is uh, shown as a top uh, level view um, of a layer. So the idea is that the IPCP can forward its packets to the destination. So let's say the blue dot represents the endpoints of the flow. Uh, and so the idea is um, that the packet gets forwarded to the destination. So let's uh, think back to how this happens in TCP IP. So for TCP IP, you would need to deploy a lot of services, uh, such as the HCP server for uh, distributing addresses uh, from a central authority. Uh, DNS is also not completely decentralized. Um, you would need the different routing protocols and they're all different pieces of software. You need firewalls, stuff like that. Uh, so in our system, this is no longer needed. The only thing you need is the IPCP uh, that uh, collaborates with the other IPCPs in uh, the layer to obtain, uh, well, to provide IPC uh, to its applications. So. Uh, then how do we construct such a layer? Well, let's go through it step by step. So of course, the first IPCP that you create, it needs to be bootstrapped. So uh, in the example, we have two systems that are connected to each other uh, via Ethernet. So we have the Ethernet layer from before again, uh, which here we call uh, E. Uh, and on top, we want to create a normal layer, uh, which is called N. So there I've created the first IPCP. So how does this, uh, yeah, so oops. Uh, <laughs> So when you bootstrap an IPCP, uh, we use, again, the uh, handy tool IRM that we developed. So if you type IRM IPCP bootstrap, it will just output uh, the different uh, things that you can configure. Since it's the first IPCP uh, in the layer, uh, we need to configure it as we please. So for now, we well, it's not uh, 
super extensive uh, our list yet, but um, for instance, you can select the routing policy that you want. We implemented uh, link state routing and loop free alternate, uh, which is a bit more resilient. But for instance, the default is a, a link state algorithm, and so you can configure it as you please. Um, so depending on the operating uh, on the environment that it is operating in and the scope that it should have, for instance, the address size. If it's a very large network, you want to pick a, uh, a much bigger address size. Um, so now let's actually create one. Um, so again, we start the IPC, the IPC resource manager daemon, so the IRMD, um, and then we simply execute uh, a command which is similar to um, the one for creating an Ethernet layer, but instead of Ethernet, oh, sorry, yeah, so first we create, again, the Ethernet uh, IPCP, um, because we want to uh, use the Ethernet layer uh, for constructing the layer, so we just create uh, the Ethernet IPCP ETH0, uh, as demonstrated a couple of times by now. So as we can see, uh, it has been created in the system. Then next, we uh, instantiate the actual uh, normal IPCP, and here we just selected it with default options. Um, and as you can see, we created it into the layer N. We gave the name N1, uh, and we also specified auto bind because of course we also need to bind the name so that it's reachable. It needs to be uh, bound and registered just as any other application. But if you specify auto bind, it will bind to uh, its uh, unique name, in this case N1, but it will also bind to the layer name N so that if you want to communicate with the layer, um, that um, you, can, you can communicate with uh, any IPCP that is a member of the layer. Uh, so finally, we register these two names into the Ethernet layer so that it's reachable. So, uh, and rolling into a layer, this is uh, the next step to extend uh, the layer. So we now have the bootstrapped IPCP, but of course we want to uh, add more IPCPs into the layer. So what this is is that a new IPCP that is not yet configured communicates with a member of the layer uh, to uh, authenticate with it, obtain the configuration, uh, and obtain an address in the layer. So in the end, we would end up with this very simple system of uh, one normal layer on top of the Ethernet layer. So continuing on with uh, the example, um, on the left side, we see again system one, uh, which we uh, just configured. So we have the Ethernet layer with on top the normal IPCP. And on the right side, we just created an Ethernet IPCP so that we can have communication on top. So finally, you execute uh, IRM IPCP enroll, which enrolls the new member uh, with the existing member. And as you can see, it's a very simple operation, so they just exchange uh, the configuration. Uh, it obtains an address as well, as you can see there. And in the end, it is a member, a new member of uh, the layer. Uh, then finally, we also register these names into the Ethernet layer so that it is available if yet another uh, IPCP member would like to join. So once it is a member, the next thing that you want to do is set up data transfer connections. Because becoming a member uh, is just that, so that you know how uh, it is configured. Uh, but you also want to set up some actual connections to forward data on. So let's assume that we have this uh, data transfer connectivity graph in the layer. Um, then you can see that every IPCP has an address. Uh, again, we have the endpoints of the flow, uh, and we want to get uh, from uh, the left IPCP to the top right IPCP. So we just send packets in the layer, uh, and as you can see, the, this is actually the full uh, header, uh, so it's a lot shorter than IP and TCP. Um, we don't send source addresses, so it's a lot more uh, secure and anonymous. The only thing that is needed is sending the destination address so that you know where it is going but uh, you actually synchronize all the state on flow allocation. So when you allocate flow, you exchange information, and then uh, you uh, generate an endpoint identifier, so that uh, you also have to send uh, in your packet, and a, and a time to live value, so in case you have routing problems, that uh, the packet doesn't loop forever. So it's a very simple header that's maybe six bytes, I think, and that's even for a quite big network. Um, so 
how do you set up data transfer connections? Again, it's with a very simple IRM uh, command. So you connect uh, N1 to N2 for the data transfer component. And when you do that, uh, as you can see, uh, it worked. Uh, and it also, because the normal, uh, of course, also has a directory, uh, as Dimitri explained, uh, which is actually a DHT in our case. Uh, and when you set up the first data transfer connection, it also enrolls into the directory. Uh, and then apart from the data transfer network, you can also set up a separate management network within the layer uh, to send to disseminate uh, routing information, for instance, uh, as we use link state routing, that you can uh, disseminate information about uh, the different links in the network. Uh, and it's just, yeah, as you can see, it's, it's a tree. So you can just uh, set the packets down the tree. So uh, the command is very similar to the data transfer uh, connection uh, one. So you just connect N2 to N1. So it doesn't matter because they are, uh, all IPCPs are equal. So it doesn't matter if you do it from N2 to N1 or N1 to N2. Um, and here we connect the management uh, component. And as you can see uh, from the outputs, that both uh, added each other as a new neighbor in the management network. So uh, to summarize here of, for Ouroboros over Ouroboros, so uh, these are the different functions of the layer uh, for Raptor, the Ethernet, and UDP layer. Uh, Dimitri explained that one. And so in the case of a normal layer, uh, of course, we implement this all ourselves. But the flow allocation is well, completely Ouroboros. The routing is based on ISIS, because you also don't send addresses in ISIS. You just run it directly over your subnetwork technology. Uh, the forwarding is also Ouroboros, uh, and the directory is a DHT, uh, well, Kodemlia to be uh, completely uh, correct there. And it does have an enrollment phase, uh, and the legacy technologies, well, almost none of them have an enrollment phase. Wi-Fi has, for instance, that you have to enter your, uh, your password uh, to connect to the Wi-Fi network. That's a form of enrollment as well, of joining the network. Um, so the reliability. Uh, as we said, it's between applications. So in, uh, since it's a recursive architecture, uh, the IPCPs, they're all, all uh, just applications as well. So it's one layer that is repeated. But the function of reliability and uh, flow control, checksumming, it can also be uh, repeated. It doesn't have to be repeated. But you can repeat it where it makes sense. For instance, over Ethernet, you probably don't want to do retransmission between those two IPCPs. But if you have, if you have a Wi-Fi layer, uh, you can get a lot of uh, packet drops. So it's probably interesting to do uh, uh, retransmission control there. And then in the top uh, layer for the, uh, well, the applications, the client and the server, if they want a reliable connection, they should also do retransmission. So um, we presented the synchronous API. But of course, if you have a lot of uh, flows that you create, uh, you don't want to start a thread for every flow that you create. So we also provide an asynchronous API, um, which is uh, based actually on uh, KQ. In Linux, you have ePoll. Uh, FreeBSD has KQ. They are um, more performant versions of the select syscall. Uh, but when you read uh, the research papers, the KQ one uh, seems to do a bit more, uh, well, seems to uh, be a better implementation. So it's very simple. So you just, if you create a new flow, then you just add the uh, flow descriptor to the set. Uh, and then you can just wait until one of the flow descriptors becomes ready. And then uh, you can read the packets that, that are stored in the FQ uh, and yeah, do what you have to do. So wrapping up. So I'll briefly summarize what we explained. So um, we explained a little bit about Ouroboros. So it's our research prototype uh, based on this recursive internet model. Um, it provides you a very sing single abstraction for ways to communicate between two programs that are running on two machines. It completely abstracts the, the network. So this simplifies how you write distributed applications. You saw some source code. Of course, it goes, we don't have a, a lot of time here, so maybe a bit, a lot of information to, to process in a short time. But the idea is that we have a very simple API. Uh, we have a very simple command line. So in all the configurations, uh, it's, 
it's almost a zero configuration network. There is no way that you have to worry about addresses, ports when you are configuring servers. Uh, it's a very secure and uh, trustworthy network design, and it hides all the complexity. So if you look at uh, a very abstract way for looking at it, you have a client and a server. We always send encrypted data between a client and a server. Of course, if you don't want to, you don't have to encrypt it, but you can always do that. Uh, everything that you send to the network, like destinations, are um, registered as hashes. So this is a function like DNS, but there is no there is no encrypted way for DNS. So everything that you look up on the internet, it goes to a DNS server, and it's always unencrypted. So if you're your network operator, if you're surfing for Google, that's encrypted. But then you go to the website, the DNS lookup for the IP address is always unencrypted. Um, so uh, the normal layer, it doesn't contain source addresses. So for somebody to, to, to try to analyze traffic and figure out where traffic is going, it's a lot harder than current networks. It's completely decentralized. There is no single uh, point in the network that is um, uh, yeah, a central entity. So the, the, the way that we do DNS is that it's a DHT that's running everywhere in the network. And the layers are completely self-contained, so there is no information sharing between different layers in the, in the network. So before you start uh, recompiling your kernel without a TCP IST stack, um, there's a lot of things to be done. So this is a, a research prototype. Um, we still have a lot to do, like distributed address assignment. Currently, we just give a random address in, a, in 64 bytes. Uh, we need to look at efficient layer designs, how to do efficient congestion control, uh, the implementation, we need some bug fixing, optimization. Uh, we haven't implemented the encryption, um, so we plan to do that using the, the GNU Crypto Library or, lib, or uh, OpenSSL, and we have to deploy it wider, so we're, we're looking for other people to start trying our stuff and that we can build it at larger and larger scales, so because even the test beds that we are using, we can go up to hundreds of nodes, but we can't go to thousands or millions, which is eventually where we would like to go. Uh, also, the API is, of course, um, is proprietary, so you don't, your software isn't written for the API. So uh, it's a very simple one. So what we would like to do is uh, have a sockets emulator so that we preload our library against before you uh, load the, the GNU C library, and then we can trap your socket calls and run the software over, so if you want, of course, uh, run it over Ouroboros. So um, we are on free nodes. The channel is Ouroboros. We have a mailing list. And there's the website. So please have a look at it if uh, you think it's interesting what we've been doing in these last two years. Um, so we have to acknowledge that it's partly funded by the Flemish government. So if you are not from Flanders, this development has not been wasting your tax money. Uh, we would like our colleagues that have already seen the presentation and uh, gave us feedback because the previous one was probably incomprehensible, even more than this one. So we would like to thank our European and US, US project partners that were involved in the project that we were in, in the research, so for all these discussions. Uh, our current and past master thesis students who have been involved in testing the software and uh, deploying it and extending it, and our supervisors for the opportunity that we have to work on this ambitious project. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have five minutes, a bit more. We have eight minutes left for questions. Do I see any? Just a second. Oh, yeah. You say that the source address isn't included in the packets, but then how do you do two-way communication? Uh, for those who are leaving, please try to do so quietly. Thank you. So if I uh, got your question correctly, uh, is that we don't send the source address in the packet? Yeah, so uh, when you allocate the flow, um, that's the first thing you do. So you retrieve the, the name uh, that you want to allocate the flow to. Uh, from the directory, you get the address, and you form a flow allocation request. So this is a packet that does contain the source address. Uh, so that's uh, it is sent to the endpoint, which then communicates with the RMD um, and can see if the flow can get allocated or not. 
and then uh, a flow allocation response is sent back to the other side. And just with these two messages, uh, they know uh, each other's address and the endpoint identifier that they generated. So um, to relate to something that you probably know, if you know TCP, you start with a three-way handshake uh, when you send a sin ox, uh, ox and ac. Well, actually, you could do the same in TCP where you would add the three-way handshake. You already negotiate the ports and the source address. You store it at the endpoints, and then you never have to send it again. So it's, it's a similar uh, operation. But it, it doesn't happen in the current networks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm wondering how the assignment of names on a global scale would work. Like, for example, how would we register fostem.org? Uh, so the question was on uh, registering uh, names on a global scale. So uh, if you want to try to register fostem, well, so this is something that uh, we don't have yet, but uh, you would actually need a naming service uh, that maps uh, the name to the layers that it is available in. So indeed, uh, a global namespace for names would be required. Um, yeah, probably, well, probably in the end you, you might have sort of a public internet layer uh, to which, yeah, just as we have right now, that you can just uh, then allocate a flow to the name FOSDEM. Um, Uh, given your answer to the first question, uh, what made you choose pa or flow routing versus packet routing for streams? So, uh, can you Sorry, given your answer to the first question, it seems that you chose flow routing instead of packet routing. Uh, like you establish a flow. Uh, no, uh, the, the definition of flow is different than uh, in, for instance, MPLS networks. So, uh, to repeat the question, um, the question was why we uh, selected flow routing instead of packet routing. So, but this is, uh, yeah, we are, so the, the answer is that we are doing packet routing. So the flow is just uh, the synchronization of state uh, in the layer so that you have the endpoints, but uh, from that point on, uh, you're basically doing packet uh, switch networking uh, within each layer. Okay, uh, any other questions? Any further ones? I don't see hands. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, warm applause for our speakers. Uh, for those of you who are leaving, please look uh, if there is any trash, bottles or anything that you can take with you and transport outside. That makes everything a bit happier and easier for the rest of us. Thank you.